Hey guys, Mountain Montage here. In this video, we will rank the top 10 peaks in the Oregon Cascades in order of relative difficulty as well as what it takes to climb each one. For the purposes of simplicity, we will be comparing the easiest or standard route options for each mountain. Andrew broke his ankle skiing at the end of March. Rails are not my friends. So we're going to take some time to rehab and get back into the mountains ourselves. If you're interested in learning more about any of these climbs, I will include the full video for each climb in the description. This beautiful mountain is located down in southern Oregon. The climb is roughly about 12 miles with 4,300 feet elevation gain and is generally easiest in mid to late summer. I climbed it in October after a little fresh snow. The day I climbed this peak, it was extremely windy. It starts off with a few easy miles on the PCT, then breaks off on a well-marked climber's trail that heads up the East Ridge. There are some pretty cool views of the East Face as you ascend the ridge. There's pretty much a trail the whole way, but it does turn a little scrambly near the top. From the summit, you'll be rewarded with beautiful views of Southern Oregon all the way down to Shasta. And with summer conditions, there's nothing too technical about this mountain, but it is a pretty good hike. Coming in at Oregon's third tallest peak, South Sister is far from the hardest. The standard route starts at Devil's Lake and heads up the south side. Overall, the route is about 12 miles with 5,000 feet of elevation gain. While the miles and elevation make this climb no walk in the park, there is a trail pretty much the entire way, so in ideal conditions during late summer or early fall, it's really just a long walk. The views in the Sisters are hard to beat, making this one of the most popular mountains in Oregon. Right next door to South Sister is Middle Sister. This mountain is a little bit more remote and therefore far less travel than her sister to the south. There are two main routes up this mountain. The easiest is the south side, which people typically start from Pole Creek Trailhead and hike into Camp Lake and head up from there. Expect a moderate scree slope and some low key class three scrambling. The route ends up being about 17 miles with 5,300 feet of elevation round trip. Most people will opt to break this up with an overnight, but it could be done in a long day. The North Ridge is the other standard route, though this route can be a little bit more technical depending on the conditions. It does require crossing over the Hayden Glacier up to the Prouty Saddle and then ascending the final thousand feet up the North Ridge. The ridge peaks around 40 to 50 degrees. In late summer, it's just steep loose scree and some scrambling. Fall, winter, and spring, it makes for a nice, moderate ice or snow route. I believe one could avoid the glacier and still do this route by going to the right of Prouty Point, but this does add some more distance. This route is about 15 to 16 miles with 5,300 feet of elevation. Just north of Crater Lake lies Mount Thielsen, which is nicknamed the Lightning Rod of the Cascades. This very pointy mountain is one of my favorite scrambles. Round trip, the climb is around 9 miles with 4,000 feet of elevation gain. There is a moderate trail up through the forest for the first few miles. Once above the tree line, the slope steepens and many vague climbing trails seem to come together and go up through the talus and scree. I preferred to stick more on the left side of the ridge. Near the top, things turn into a more solid class 3 scramble. <clears throat> the route wraps around the base of the summit pinnacle to the south to what is known as Chicken Ledge. From here, one has to decide if they really want to climb that final 80 feet of class 4 to the summit. Many people do choose to solo this, but it is also common for people to set protection on the way up, or at least bring a rope to rappel down. I chose to solo up and back down. It was a little spicy, but not bad for my comfort zone. The exposure on top is incredible on all sides. Incredible. All right, next door to the Sisters is Broken Top, which is an exceptional climb. Covering about 13 miles with 4,000 feet of elevation gain, starting at the Green Lakes Trailhead, you will follow a beautiful trail along the creek filled with waterfalls for about four miles. Once you get to Green Lakes area, there is an unmarked climber's trail heading south away from the lakes. This climber's trail will gain the Northwest Ridge. The ridge is a mix of faint climber's trail with some fun class three scrambling. At the top of the ridge, you come to a short cliff band. There's a large crack running up it, which is rated 5.0. Some people feel comfortable soloing up and down this, while others opt to set up ropes. 
After climbing the ledge, continue scrambling up and to the right just below the summit pinnacle. After a few hundred feet of easy scrambling and some exposed traversing, you'll come to the edge of the crater. The true summit is just a little bit more scrambling back towards the north. This summit has one of my favorite views in all of Oregon. If you are soloing, you can reverse the scramble back the way you came. If you brought a rope, you can repel. With a 60 meter rope, you can repel all the way from the summit to just below the cliff band and bypass all the technical bits. But don't forget to bring a floaty and enjoy Green Lakes while you are here. Oh, hey guys! <laughs> Mount Hood is Oregon's tallest peak. Unique to the rest of the mountains on this list, it is easiest to do in the spring or early summer, while the snow is still covering the whole route. Under even the best of conditions, Mount Hood is still a technical mountain, requiring the climber to have and know how to safely use the right gear. Crampons and an ice axe are a necessity. That being said, once you've acquired the right gear and the skills, the standard route up the south side is usually not too difficult. Although the climb does gain over 5,700 feet with round trip miles of less than 8 miles. Other challenges with Hood include that you typically must start in the night as it is important to be off of the upper mountain before it heats up too much and becomes more hazardous. The route is a fairly straightforward slog for the first three miles up to the Devil's Kitchen area. This is a good regrouping spot before the technical parts. Watch out for cracks and hollowed out snow from the fumarole in this area. From the hog's back, one must choose which route to ascend. Depending on the conditions and what time of year, the easiest or standard route will either be Old Chute or the Pearly Gates. The Pearly Gates left is usually a straightforward 40 to 50 degree chute. Sometimes it's only a few feet wide in places. The rhyme formations that form here are absolutely magical. Congestion is often an issue with the Pearly Gates. The right gate is usually a little harder than the left and sometimes has a fun but small eye step in it. If you're feeling more adventurous or have the confidence in this terrain, this can be a good alternative to the overcrowded left gate. From the top of the gates is a short walk up moderate snow to the summit. Personally, I like to descend Old Chute, which takes you across the catwalk on the summit ridge. This is one of my favorite spots. Old Chute is usually a pretty straightforward slope of about 40 to 50 degrees. Near the top you can get some cool rind blobs, but then it opens up. Most people take the traverse back to Hog's Back. Moving quickly is very important in this area to avoid overhead rock and ice fall. This climb starts with about six gentle miles on the PCT, winding up through the burnt Jefferson Wilderness. Once at the base of the mountain, a steep climber's trail heads up to gain the south ridge. There is fun class 3 up through here, but try to stay on the so-called beaten path. If the rock suddenly seems atrociously bad, you are off for out. This route follows the ridge up and down with some pretty fun scrambles. The exposure truly begins once you get closer to what's known as the crawl. The crawl is the first section of the climb that is more technical, and many parties do opt to run protection here. The climbing on the crawl is rated class 4 and nothing very difficult, but the exposure is pretty intense, making these sections more psychologically difficult for some. After the crawl, there is a series of ledges to scramble up until you reach the base of the summit block. The chimney is considered the crux. This section is about 30 feet of nearly vertical rock climbing. Many parties do set protection here. The climbing is rated 5.0. So while it is nearly vertical, the rock climbing itself is pretty easy. After you get through the chimney, it's a short bit of exposed glass floor scrambling to the top. The summit is an exposed bed, with the true summit being on the opposite side. From here, you can down climb or repel back the way you came. Overall, this mountain gets a bad rap for being really terrible rock. Personally, I find that if you stay on route, it's pretty decent. If you get off route, it can get deadly. Round trip, it's about 14 miles and 3,000 feet of elevation gain. I think Three Finger Jack and Mount Washington are pretty similar in difficulty, with Three Finger Jack being a little more exposed and Washington being slightly more technical. This climb starts at Big Lake Trailhead. After three easy miles on the PCT, you come to the Climbers Trail. 
This trail can be somewhat hard to stay on at times, but eventually you'll find yourself on top of the ridge with the mountain straight in front of you. There's a decent trail that heads up the ridge. In places it becomes more of a scramble. As you approach the summit block, you will want to traverse on the right side of these rocky towers, following a faint climber's trail. Resist the urge to head up these gullies. If you get off route at all, time, the rock becomes extremely bad. Traverse all the way to the final gully below the summit block and then climb up to the saddle. The saddle is a good staging area for the technical climbing ahead of you. The summit block is about 300 feet, which is comprised of three main pitches. Many parties choose to run protection on parts or all of this climb, while others are quite comfortable soloing this climb. Personally, I feel the climbing is pretty easy as long as you know the route. Pitch 1 starts from the saddle and scrambles up to moderate quality rock up this ramp. Once in the ramp, it's an easy and not very exposed climb to what is the crux. The crux is a short but slightly overhanging ledge. This section is rated 5-3, but is only a few moves. Once you get up this ledge, there is another steep section that is a little easier but more exposed. This takes you to the top of a large landing with a wrap station. The second pitch is less straightforward, but much easier. The easiest way of this pitch kind of winds back and forth across small cliff bands with moderate class 3 and occasional class 4 scrambling. None of it is really exposed, since it is a series of wide ledges. The third pitch is rated 5.0 and has a 30 to 40 foot section that is pretty steep but relatively easy rock climbing. We found the rock here to be pretty decent. After this section, it is a short section of class 3 to the summit. Most parties will do a combination of rappelling down and down climbing, depending on your personal comfort level and conditions. There is usually an abundance of wrap stations on this wrap. The first pitch is particularly fun to rappel, as a full 60 meter rope will get you all the way back to the saddle. Gee, whoa. From here, reverse the way you came on the ridge. Overall, this climb covers 13 miles and 3,300 feet of elevation gain. The infamous North Sister takes a close second place on this list. We climbed in the fall after the first snow. However, this didn't change things much. The route starts at Pole Creek Trailhead and begins with some casual miles through a burnt out forest. After about four miles, you come to an unmarked climber's trail, which begins to take you west towards the valley between North and Middle Sister. From here, you have a choice of taking the East Ridge or continuing west towards Hayden Glacier and coming up the South Ridge next to Prouty Point. We took the East Ridge, which later I learned was not the easiest way. We bushwhacked our way up to gain the ridge. The ridge in itself is not at all straightforward and there isn't much of anything for a clear pass. We scrambled our way up and back down and to the right and to the left of various obstacles. The route finding was a decent challenge and the rock quality was overall pretty bad. Part way up, the east and south ridges merge. From here, you must make a traverse around on the north side with some airy exposure. The rock is not to be trusted, so moving slowly and carefully is important. Once you reach the saddle, then you traverse the cliffs on the south side to the terrible traverse. Aptly named, this area is very loose and overhead rockfall is a serious concern. We first attempted to stay high, but found that the rock was just too bad and we could not safely make it. We made an impromptu rappel down to where it was a lower angle. The fresh snow proved to be much easier to cross than the loose rock. After the traverse, you come to the bowling alley. The lower section is moderate scrambling. As it gets steeper, the route becomes less obvious. We went straight up the gully, only to realize later that the correct route headed up and to the right. It was supposed to be class 4, but the way we went was certainly harder. I made a few moves up the wall and realized just how bad the rock was. I felt I could not safely down climb what I had just come up, so I continued up carefully until I could make a makeshift anchor to belay off. I think we went the wrong way. That did not feel like class 4. From here, it's a relatively easy scramble to the summit. The views were amazing. 
After down climbing the summit block, we found the wrap station on the other side of the bowling alley and did two rappels to get back down to the traverse. We clocked 17 miles with 5,600 feet of elevation gain. Coming in at Oregon's second highest peak, climbing Jefferson is a minimum of over 15 miles and 7,000 feet of elevation gain. The combination of the long miles and elevation gain coupled with the technical rock and snow difficulties of this mountain make it the hardest, in my opinion. We took several days for this climb, but we also added some extra mileage and elevation by bagging Goat Peak along the way. In general, we took the South Ridge approach, starting from Pamelia Lake Trailhead. After several beautiful miles through the forest, you will get to the lake, where you get to get your first good views of the mountain. Another four to five miles on the PCT brings you to Shale Lake. From here, you will bushwhack or follow a faint climbing trail straight towards the mountain. Eventually, you'll find yourself scrambling up loose scree and moderate class 3 rock up to the Red Saddle. From here, you are only 300 vertical feet from the summit, but the real climbing is just starting. You will traverse around the base of the summit block, usually on steep ice or snow with an angle of up to 60 degrees. We opted to solo this, but many people do run protection here. After the traverse, you can choose your route up. Most all of the rock is class 5 and very rotten. There is a class 4 option, but the route finding was not very straightforward for us. We found ourselves traversing around, trying to find a decent way up, while sending large rocks thousands of feet down. As you come around to the northwest aspect, it opens up into a wide gully with the north ridge directly above you. I believe the class 4 route goes up and to the left from here. We ended up on the north ridge, which actually had some decent rock. The crux was this awkward move where you have to pull yourself up and over this blocky slab. It's rated 5-3, but the rest of the ridge was just some very exposed class 3 or class 4 scrambling. From the summit, we opted to rappel straight down into the snow. Two rappels with a 60 meter rope got us back down. It is very important to pass this traverse early in the day or in colder temps, otherwise the snow turns to mush and it can be very difficult and dangerous. This is a big reason why this climb is usually done over a couple of days, otherwise you would need to start extremely early. Thanks guys for joining us on all of our adventures and we look forward to sharing more of our videos with you and exploring all of the Pacific Northwest and then some. Long day. Beautiful mountains.